digital dominance. <laughs> digital dominance. Five killer strategies to build a killer BDC. Hi, Jim Ziegler, the Alpha Dog. And I think I've got one heck of a good show for you today because my good friend, and I'm talking about this woman is an absolute genius. She's, she's absolutely one of the very best in technology, internet marketing, in all of the automotive stratosphere. This is my friend, Jennifer Briggs. Here she comes. Um, anyway, Jennifer, hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? How are you looking good? Well, uh, thank you. You ready to do some rock and roll? I am. I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay. Digital dominance. I love that title. Um, we're promising big things today, and I know you're the person to do it. Well, and, I, um, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's important. I think that's the perfect title for it, Jim, because it is about dominating the business digitally. So I think that was great. Everything, everything is digital. See, you see, people don't realize in today's market, salesmanship is good, but actually marketing is more important. Getting the people into the dealership, uh, getting the, you know, when it, by the time a customer hits a, hits a showroom, they've already made a decision. Honestly, a lot of times by the time the lead hits your <laughs> CRM, they're right there. They're getting down there and they've already made a lot of decisions, but you're right. Getting them in, it's not like it used to be. I remember when I started back in 02, I mean, we had a, a, a small, we were in Saginaw, Michigan. That's a small store, but we were selling like 700 units a month back then. You've been, and, you've been a top executive with some of the premier dealerships in the country. I know your history. And I know that you are an executive manager. I, I mean, I, I this, ladies and gentlemen, this woman is one of the most qualified executives in the retail end of the car business, the variable operation. I, I hold her in high regard. So pay attention, take some notes and, and listen to what we have to say. You know, and okay, when I was starting out in sales back, you know, we were selling Conestoga wagons, but I still <laughs> When I started out in sales, you'd come up to the sales desk and I'd tell the manager, I've got a customer on the phone and they want to know how much it is. Get them in. Mm -hmm. well, what am I going to tell them? Get them in. <laughs> that, was, that was the entire thing. Get them in. Well, yeah. Okay, we got five killer strategies and you and I have already talked about this. What is the number one strategy if you're putting together a BDC from scratch or you've got a failing BDC or you're not quite happy with your BDC, what's the number one strategy? Well, the, the first thing is in, in their strategies or steps or building blocks or whatever, whatever fits into how you're trying to structure this in your business. But I'm going to take you back a step and, and say – you should be looking at this like any other business unit. So the first step or strategy is to make sure that you're actually planning for this business development department. It's not just a call center. It's not a room above the parts department. You throw a bunch of people in there with the phone. Wait, and you don't put a bunch of people in a phone room? No, I'm saying if you haven't actually taken a look at your sales forecast for the year and decided that the reason for me building this department is to grow incremental unit volumes, if you haven't taken a look at that and said, okay, for easy math, we're at 100 units, I want to be at 120, and then used that to create a, a performa, you are not going to have a profit center. You're going to have a call center. The dealership is capable of selling 120. If they're not capable, I mean, if they're if they if the traffic's not there, the demographics not there, the market's not there. It, 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 if you don't look at those numbers, if you're not actually analyzing it to say I can do this now, most most dealerships, if you're doing a hundred, you could easily do hundred and twenty if you do some efficient steps that we're going to talk about today. So they might say the market's not there, or traffic's not there, but part of this process in digital dominance is looking at where you are and figuring out the fastest way to grow and then sharpening it as you go, which is actually the step we're going to end with. So I don't want to give away the good stuff. Don't give it away. I've <laughs> consulted thousands of dealerships through the years. And I've been in thousands of dealerships, believe it or not. I've actually set foot in a thousand showrooms or more. And 
I always told dealers, you don't sneak up on growth. No. You explode into growth, but first you have to determine what realistic number is the ultimate number your dealership can do. Yep. What is your dealership's ultimate number? Realistically, what, what will the market bear? And then act like you're already doing it. Don't try to, most dealers want to gradually grow the dealership. No, you explode into the numbers all at once. Yeah, but you gotta, you have to know that goal. It's so hard to create a plan to get somewhere if you don't actually know the goal. And, and what we see happening all over is, oh, my sales kids are terrible at answering the leads. Our closing ratio is only 4%. We need to do something. They're focusing on, and it is an important metric, do not get me wrong, closing ratio is an important metric. But when you're talking about the growth of the dealership, you need to be looking at that, I want 120% increase in my unit volumes, and then work backwards into it. That's why you need I'm a plan. A guy. I believe in BDC. I'm, 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 I'm sold on BDC. I go back to Stuker and Traver in the day when it, when it was in its infancy. I am a BDC guy. You can't beat salespeople hard enough to stay in a phone room. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. I mean, some of them will, and those aren't, those aren't going to be your best closers. You know, it, it is it is difficult. And I have had every every structure and that's kind of running into the the second step or second strategy that you need to consider when you're building a well badass BDC, right? You want to have it or a business development dealership or department, as opposed to for some reason, the word BDC, we feel like they're just operators, right? We just threw them in the room. But once we know that, we got to look at that structure and appointment setting is they, it is more controllable. You can get folks who are going to follow that process every single time. Now, I have a lot of cradle to grave Internet sales people. Well, you're working with some big groups right now, aren't you? I am. I am working with some big groups right now and we have every different structure that there is. But especially if you're in a situation where you want to be able to have an accelerated pace in your growth, like you were saying, explode into it, you have to be able to control the process uh, and the structure of that. Who's going to staff it? So you have to start with that. Like you said, Jim, look at your marketing. How many phone calls do we have a month? How many internet leads? How many, ooh, ready for this one, guys, make sure you're paying attention. How many records do you have in your database? Because that's something we don't ever look at when considering How many records. Do you have in your database? Right. Are you talking about dead leads or active leads? I'm talking about all records in your database. Dead, active, sold. We're servicing only. We didn't sell them anything. I'm talking about that's wow. actually the most efficient marketing source that we have. And we don't even touch it when we're talking it about our business development center. You know, most dealerships that I have had experience with have 50, 100,000 dead leads in the CRM DMS. Oh, I mean, and, and those aren't dead leads. Those are actually living human beings in your market. They tried to buy a car from you at one time or another. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they're, but they're still living and breathing and living in your neighborhood. And, <laughs> yeah, right? But can I, I'll share with you guys a secret and this wasn't on the agenda. Um, all those ones that are marked dead, when it comes to nurture marketing or email campaigns from branding or offers from the dealership, I'm deploying those to your dead leads too. Because even if I don't have a sales team to follow up with them or BDC to follow up with them, we're going to have a strategy to make sure that we wrap our arms around those customers. I think that's what we talk about with digital dominance. It's the combination of marketing, your BDC, or who's handling those opportunities that are generated, and then making sure that you're also working your database. There are so many records in there. And easily without increasing uh, one penny in your marketing budget, if you get efficient with those opportunities and you have the right structure to handle all three types, right? Well, it's actually four. Four? Um, four. Oh, well, because you have, four, 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 four. we have internet ups, okay. phone ups, showroom ups, and then you've got your database. Those are the four different types of opportunities that your business development center should be working. One more time. 
So we have internet ups. Internet ups. Phone ups. Phone ups. Showroom ups. Showroom right? ups. They didn't buy. Uh -huh. And then your database. So we have four, four different types that they should and be working. Data mining. You are data mining. Uh, yeah. Why would, I, I mean, those are our customers. It's easier to, that, yeah, it's easier to communicate with somebody who already knows you than it is to just start a cold conversation. Those I mean, Jim. Leads, those dead leads, they're real people. I, I can't emphasize that enough. What I love, um, which is always interesting, I was just doing some, uh, and which is actually something that we train on, we train on watching our customers move down the funnel. Now in the processes that I build, and this is segueing perfectly into the tactics and training that we do in the next step. Um, so, but I train them and I'll leave the process open. Right. So we, if we've decided in step two, this is going to be our structure. We need to have three appointment setters. Um, Susan is is not really good with Internet, but she's really great with the data mining portion. So we're going to let Paul and Jane work the incoming opportunities. Susan is going to be our database lady. She is going to crush it over there. We've made those decisions. And then we got to decide on processes, right? What's the tactic? Okay, that's the next step. That's the next step. The process. But before we get to processes, let's dwell where we're at for a second because I am so strong. People tell me, well, we're data mining and I find out they're not data mining, they're equity mining. Oh right? goodness. Oh yeah, we could talk about this one for a while. Together. I'm talking about the data you have in your CRM that you have put away as dead leads. You're no longer working them, but, and maybe those people bought a car elsewhere. And, and the other thing is more than 50% of the customers in most service departments didn't buy the car from you. Yeah. And I, I was going to say, I, I could not agree with you more when it comes to that. I don't equity mine. Quite frankly, if I'm trying to get car deals out of my CRM or uh, I, I will find car deals in Viato, by the way, um, because when it comes down to it, and I I think I started doing this even before equity mining was a tool, um, because I started in accounting, and I could, I was the admin director, and I could write reports in my DMS that would show me when folks were coming to end of term that were doing these types of things, I could hand it to my new car manager and say, go get it. That's what impresses me about you, Jennifer. You are a program. Every time I, I talk to you, and, I, and you're one of my best friends, and I talk to you consistently, uh, and you're you're, pro, you're reprogramming a CRM, or you're 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 changing the programs in the DR DMS. I mean, you you are absolutely hands on a programmer. You know what you're talking about, and I, I've seen you call these CRM people to task any number of times. <laughs> You know, what I think is nice about this, and, and I tell people all the time, I, I am, I write four different programming languages. I'm a certified BI developer, trained business analyst, accidental car guy, right? Um, but if you don't use these tools and leverage them to support your sales strategy, and whether it's data mining or the follow-up process or what it might be, then they're working against you. So taking time, to actually leverage the tools and technology that you have is huge. One thing I always like to share with folks, I, it's a, I heard it's now something they charge more for, but if you had it old school in Viato, mm -hmm. there's, a, um, there's a service appointment report, Jim. And what is different about that report, and I've used that to buy a lot of cars out of service, is that it doesn't go off of equity. It doesn't look at any of that. What it looks at is your sales data. So how quickly can my used car manager sell that unit? And the ones that have a grade or stocking number, they'll say, okay, last month you sold 12, you only have five in stock. So that's a, a, a negative seven on the stocking position. And my used car manager is going to step up on that offer. So if I have my BDC call those folks before they come in for service tomorrow and just let them know, while you're in service, we would love to be able to actually tell you, give you a number, what we'd cut you a check for your car. It is something that we need for our used car lot. You don't have to worry about it. We'll just take a quick peek while you're having your oil change or whatever they're having done. And then you have an opportunity to put in front of them. And, and I don't like to use the word trade in that, for instance. 
And the reason for that is those folks aren't in that cycle. And I don't want to, to abruptly flip that on for them. So I actually will say, you know, we just like to take a look at your vehicle and let you know how much we'd cut you a check for. Because wow. if I'm, yeah, cut you a check for. And that is, again, I don't want to pull them into the salesy kind of thing. They're in the back of the house. And, and I'm sorry, I have stolen a lot of, but my used car departments always pay for those ROs when we buy those cars out of service. So it's fine. <laughs> Fantastic. Can you see me right now? I, I see you. You look like you're in the corner of the screen. I want to be in the corner of the screen. Very good. I cannot see you right now. My, my technology is messing up. Let's just continue on. You can see me. You can hear me. Let's go. All right. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. Tell, tell me more about step number three. So step number three that we've been talking about, like as Jim alluded, and I, there are so many other brilliant programmers. I've just learned how to leverage that technology. And, and there are some things that we can do a lot better Um uh, can I repeat that to leverage the technology, Tanya, I saw your, your comment there. So when we are looking at the different pieces of technology, we started this conversation by saying the difference between equity mining and data mining and data yeah. mining is something completely different. We have, you know, companies out there that are selling, you know, equity mining products, those products also have some of these other things. So if, if they're servicing with you, but I, I go back old school when there wasn't any technology for it. So we had to find other ways to do it, uh, which makes it very, very hard for uh, those partners at, at the dealerships that I work with because the expectations are a lot higher and I'm looking for integrations that will streamline things for my team. Uh, one thing I know that we've talked about in the past before, Jim, is how many different software systems our teams have to log into in order to get a car deal done. So leveraging those technology partners as part of- I'm a, I'm a world-class, but I got to tell you, the things they have to do today, uh, they have to log into a CRM. They got to log into all these other programs I mean, no wonder it's taking so long to sell a car. The, the manager has, has to deal with so many computer programs and so, so much technology just to sell a car. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a four square and a green Sharpie anymore. It, it's not in, in running, running your business from a profitability standpoint is I think probably what some of those tools were intended on to begin with. But for us at, at an executive leadership level, we have to take a look at those tools and make sure that they're integrated. Training is a big thing that we talk about in BDCs. And we talk about what word tracks and how you overcome objections. We talk about those things all the time. But what we don't talk about is do our teams know how to leverage that technology in an efficient way so that they can actually sell more cars. Now we do need to train on word tracks and we need to train on video emails. We have to train on all of the, those are the, the tactical elements, right? Yeah, absolutely. Word tracks, things to say to the customer and they got to be heartfelt. They can't be, I always say it's, it's not memorization, it's conversation. They're that is, people. <laughs> it's so fantastic because I, I come across so many individuals they are like, Jennifer, I don't know what to say in this video email. I was just having this conversation yesterday and well, what am I, I don't know what to say. I, I can't do video. I can't have a, that. Well, what would you say if they were right in front of you? Well, I would say this and this and this, and then it sounds fantastic. And I'm like, okay, well do me a favor. Just say that in the video. If that's what you would say to them in real life, it's kind of like we get stage fright in these internet departments or business development departments it's the same. Just have that same conversation with the customer. I think that's why video is more effective because I can come across a whole lot more friendly and conversational when we're like this versus just in type. Video, video humanizes the person on the other end. You know, I, I pioneered video in the car business. I, I was, know you I was, did. I, was I know. Before anybody. <laughs> yeah. Flip camera. We, uh, we bought flip cams in my first internet department because yeah. you talked about them. I, I was teaching it. I was teaching video long before it became a mainstream mode in the business. And well, I, I'd learned it from other, other conferences I attended that were non-car business conferences. 
Yeah, I'm I'm always grateful for those types of things that that you bring in. I talk about that now and people are like, "What's a flip cam?" I'm like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I found a picture of me teaching on with a flip cam the other day when I was going through some oh. of my storage. Uh, <laughs> I think you should have said social. <laughs> Amazing. I, I spoke at Digital Dealer on the flip cam once. I think Digital Dealer number four, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it really did. And a lot of people, we talk about the the success in, in me growing in, in my career, which I started in accounting. So I came up on the other side of it. It was a unique position. But I think that's what has led me to leverage all the technology to make it more efficient. And I will tell you, in my first internet sales department, um, we had a 27% lift in unit sales in that department in 45 days after I took over. Mm -hmm. And we were leveraging technology in order to make those teams more effective. And there, there are so many things available. You know, it used to be a whole lot harder when we had those flip cams in order to do it, but we made it work. And what I don't, and maybe it's because folks have too many options now, Jim, um, but it's important to find a tool that is easy for your team to use and that you can integrate so that they don't have 17 different systems. And I think that's part of why I like to configure the CRMs. Uh, we talk about it all the time. The CRM should be your sales assistant. Sales assistants are, are not very common. Tanya had a question. I'll put it on the screen here for you. Now, I don't know what she wants to you to repeat, but... <laughs> I think that was um, when when we were talking about leveraging the technologies. Uh, Tanya, you'll have to let me know if I had hadn't repeated that for you uh, appropriately. But it was uh, shortly after you were bragging on me being a programmer, and the languages I write are so old, most programmers would laugh at me right now. But they work for what we need to do in the car business. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so Tanya, just let us know if, if that that is not the answer to your question and I'll be happy. Uh, or you can always reach out to me. Uh, Jim is putting my cell phone number down, shoot me a text and I'd be happy to answer uh, on the air for everyone. Fantastic. Okay, we're on number five, four or five. We're on number four. We spent a lot of time on number four. I lost track. I got it, Jim. <laughs> you, you, handle the, you handle the technology portion of this and then I'll handle the but uh, uh, yeah. it, it was number four is this is actually your, one of your favorite things to say, by the way. We don't have a knowing problem in our business. We have a doing problem. We have an execution issue. You paid yeah. attention, didn't you? L listen, I am super proud that the, the alpha dog is my mentor. Of course, I pay attention. And it is for me when I, I came into the car business, I saw a lot of inefficiencies and this is, this is where that comes into play. We'll train, maybe we'll bring a trainer in for a few days and then everybody does really great for two weeks and then it falls off because the execution of a new strategy, of a new process, of a new word track, whatever it is, as you're building out this business development department, if you do not have accountability and inspection points, you will not have a team that retains that. I'm going to say that one more time. If you, as part of execution of these strategies or steps to build out your BDC, if you do not have accountability points and inspection points, it will be really hard to succeed. Very hard to succeed. Very hard. you got to have the inspection points. You, you, you don't... There's an old saying in the car business, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. Absolutely. I got a, a Zigglerism on the end of that. Would you like to hear it? I would. You don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect, and you've got what you tolerate. <clears throat> that is a nice addition. I, I am telling, uh, I'm telling um, sales managers and GMs all the time when they're like, well, oh, they just won't do it. I said, no. And I, I, because I'm a mom. So of course I say, no, kids will get away with whatever you let them get away with. At this dealership, we're a family and you're a leader. So that puts you into that role. So they will get away with whatever it is that you let them get away with. Yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> 
But one of the things, and I learned this early on in my career, uh, probably I was 19 years old, I became a general manager um, of a Godfather's Pizza. So if you're from the Midwest, you know that pizza chain. But my, my training for that was the five minute manager series. And the one thing that I took away from that was if you have a problem, it's either a knowing problem or a caring problem. And as we talk about expectations, I want to make sure all of you here who are considering building a BDC, considering bulldozing your current BDC and starting over, make your expectations to your team very clear. It is hard to hold people accountable to a gray area. So if you are expecting them to make 75 phone calls, make 50 video emails, and send 50 text messages every day, they need to know that. And you need to put it in writing so that when you go back, or if you expect a certain process to be used, have an inspection point, but make sure it's very clear. I use scorecards. And, and not like the old school phone scorecards, but I use scorecards that have different tips for the teams to help increase engagement from those customers, because that's what we want to do. And so our managers are required to inspect the team's performance on a regular basis. If you don't have that inspection point, then, then you end up, I mean, it's kind of like a waste of everybody's time and money. And unfortunately, I feel like that's where so many BDCs are. Nobody knows how to inspect what these people are doing. We took those three folks, we threw them in that room above the parts department or body shop. I've had that happen one time before. Those fumes work crazy. I have seen that so many times. The body shop, the parts department, they're, they're up there. In, <laughs> no air whatever. Do you know why that started? That started because I don't know about y'all's dealerships, but every dealership that I've been in, we keep the old computers above the parts department in some storage room. And that's what I saw early BDCs because they were already old junky computers up there that had come out of the office or whatever. And then that became the internet department. You know, most BDCs work for minimum wage and free pizza, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. I, I get so excited about this position because when it is properly executed, it is a great earning and income. And I always tell folks, I've had BD agents who've worked on my teams that make anywhere from $2,500 to $9,000 a month, just depending upon the structure depending in the store. The structure. Now, something I, something you, you and I discussed yesterday Hmm? was outbound phone calls, out outbound contact, uh, tail lights. We talked about, we talked about, see, I, I don't see a BDC as an incoming call center. I, I want it to be a complete business communications center. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing that one back up because those tail light calls, we, we touched on a little bit that unsold showroom traffic. And for those of you who've been in the business, you guys remember this. It used to be our job as a sales manager to make that phone call. And, and if you can and you have the resources, it is a great option to have your sales managers make that call. The customer left, they didn't buy. Let's have that phone call to find out why. It might. Some people call it a one reason phone call. I like to call it a taillight call because that's what you're seeing as they're driving off the lot, not in your car. But... Um, when I was with Dyer and Dyer Volvo back in the day, we went from 40 units a month to 850 units a month in less than a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, 40 units a month and a Volvo store. That is. That we, is. And I wasn't the, the general manager. I was one of the managers. I was not in charge, but I was a participant. And when we had a customer that didn't buy a car for any reason, Within 12, 24 hours, mostly within 12 hours, a manager, not a salesperson, was on the phone with them. Absolutely. I mean, a manager would call back everybody. Now we got the BDC that are professional people that can take that load off the manager who's got all those other technology duties. Absolutely. Because there are so many other duties we're requiring of them now. And use that business development department as a customer care department. Have them make that phone call. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I work here at uh, ABC Motors. And I was just calling to see how your visit with Jim went. Did he answer all of your questions? 
there anything else we can get for you? And and if I could just ask you, if there was one reason you decided not to purchase, right, and roll into it, in your business development center can make sure that happens every single time. Your sales oh, managers are going to struggle to do it. Listen, I will tell you what, in some markets where it is highly, highly aggressive, if that person leaves the dealership, I have that call scheduled between 15 and 30 minutes after their showroom visit is ended. Really? 30 minutes? I do, because here's the thing. You know, we have consumers are visiting less and less dealerships. If it's 1.4 or whatever that number is today, it seems to be kind of a moving target. But if they're visiting less and if they're they're out shopping and they left my dealership, where do you think they're going next? What if, uh, they're, they're on the way to, if it's Saturday, especially, they're on the way to another one. So I am trying weekday to catch shoppers, that. Weekday shoppers and Saturday shoppers are two different things. Saturday oh, shoppers yes. want to get it all done in one day. Uh -huh. A weekday shopper is going to get it done after work. And they're going to be two or three days visiting dealerships if yeah. you don't cut them off. I've got a great word track for that customer care manager. Oh, yeah. Let's would hear it. Would you like to hear a Ziegler, Ziegler word track? Always. Uh, hi, I'm Mr. Hi, Mr. Jones. This is Jim Ziegler. I'm a customer care representative at Dyer and Dyer Volvo. And I see you were in the dealership yesterday. And I, I want to apologize that we didn't have the car you were looking for. Oh, no, you did have the car we were looking for. You just couldn't give me enough money for my trade in. Wait, wait a minute. You're telling me that we you actually worked a deal and they didn't have an, enough money for your trade. Is that what you're telling me? Oh, my God. Listen, I. I'm a, I'm a personal representative of the dealer and um, we have certain people that's, what kind of car do you have? Well, I've got a, a 2018 um, Ford Explorer. You know, we, we, we're a Buick dealership, obviously, and, and we don't you ordinarily trade in Ford Explorers as much, but I, we have buyers that specialize in that kind of car. Now, the, these are outside professional buyers and we, they work by appointment. Would you give us another shot? I'll make an appointment. We want them to take a look at your car and see if we can get more money for your car. Would you, would you mind making an appointment? I have a professional buyer that specializes in your type of car. Take a look at it, see if there's any more money. How about that's, that? That's a wonderful word track. And that, and that is then we've got to then, you know, when they do come back in. And what's so nice about those calls is because it's a third voice, Sometimes, whether it's the sales manager or a customer care manager, BDC agent, whatever you call them in your store, the customers are very likely to tell you. They will open up if you ask. It's kind if of like trade, if it's a trade issue. Yeah. You say, well, I'm going to have a professional buyer look at it and see if there's any more money. We work by appointment here. And then I'm, te I'm telling you right now, even if you offer them the same amount we let them out on, they're more, more likely to do a deal. Oh, for sure. Because you're taking that extra step to mm -hmm. help them win. And and I think that's really important. We talk about that a lot. And we talk about genuine conversations. If you care about your customer and you want to help them feel like they've won, and that does not mean you have to give up money. Uh, I hate discounting. I am, I'm a, you know, fair full price is fair price, Jim. Right. Full price so is a fair price. If you give that value, and I think in that tail light call, while that word track that you just shared with everyone is so important, is not only is it a customer care manager, whether it's a sales manager, customer care manager, that manager word is magic. I work so, directly for the dealer. That is one of the strongest. <laughs> yeah. I used to say to customers, um, Mr. Dyer asked me to call you personally. That was one of the strongest closes. And, and we would laugh because we'd get Richard Dyer in the meetings. And, and I'd say, Mr. Dyer, tell people to call the customers. And Richard Dyer would say, call the customers. Okay, Mr. Dyer personally asked me to call you. He sure did. He <laughs> sure did. That's fantastic. I love that one. I hope yeah. everybody that is listening wrote that down. That yeah. is powerful for folks, especially when they've left and, and they feel like they were not given that fair price on their trade or whatever it might be, just knowing that somebody is taking interest from a management level in their deal makes people feel special. Um, it, it really does. And it's a simple step. But because our sales managers are so busy, having your business development center do that 
is huge. They're supporting our sales strategy. What lower hanging fruit are you going to get other than the people that are in your showroom? Exactly. So we got, we've already talked about the outbound phone calls. Now, I, I prefer a separate sales BDC and a service BDC. A hundred percent agree. I a hundred percent agree. I see stores try to mix it all of the time. They're two totally different objectives, two totally different play plans. And I've, I've told stores, um, you know, if that's what I, I will, I will not assist in building something that way because it cannot be successful. So if I'm speaking with a dealer and that's absolutely positively the way that they want to do it, I will give them some tips and then we will kindly part ways because I, I don't want them. I know that in six months when it, it didn't work out because the team focused on the sales stuff and not the service and now our CSI is in the tank, but the commission was bigger on sales. So they went there and service got ignored. Um, but it, there are, it's the same reason why we have a general sales manager and a service manager. We don't mix those two. We don't have the same person running those two departments. We keep them separated. They operate differently. And I think that having a service BDC is important, uh, but I'm a variable girl. So my focus is always on growing. You're not a variable. I know that. Let, let me ask you, when we, when we pay BDC, do we pay them on appointments that show? Do we pay them on appointments that are sold? What? Wh I don't want to, you to give me a pay plan, but give me a structure for a pay plan. What? Do, what? What parts of their performance do we pay on? So, so I do like paying on both because I am a big fan of one team moving in one direction. I know a lot of BDCs now are paying a higher commission only on the shown appointment and nothing on the sold because they say, well, they don't have any effect on if the car is sold or not. But for me, when I'm building out a plan in a structured department that has the right training and tools, those things are going to flow together. The transition from the appointment setting or business development department to the sales floor is probably the number one reason why those deals don't close. We uh, or they close at a lower rate because we're fumbling. Right. We've set up this wonderful VIP appointment experience in the appointment setting. We've we've wooed these customers for two weeks and then we tell them this is what's going to happen when you come into the dealership. Would like you to we're going to have the car pulled up, ready to go for you to look at. And, and then when you come in, you know, ask for so and so and they come in and what happens? They get up and then oh, they start all over and the trust is degraded because the person doesn't even know they're coming. Um, they try to up them as regular up. The car isn't pulled out. You, you're, you're right. That that I, there's a word I like. You said VIP. There's another word that goes with VIP. Concierge. I love that. Concierge is fantastic. Yes, customer care. Uh, I have some people in the dealership who are customer concierge. Absolutely. And I think yeah. at Highline stores, especially the in home delivery people that we're drifting toward, mm -hmm. you know, the Carvana prototype where we're delivering the car at their house. Mm -hmm. I like that, that person to be the concierge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's why I think if you have this structured the right way, your business development department does have an influence because we're one team working in one direction, right? Everyone, and I think um, um, someone in the comments made that comment earlier, that if all of the managers aren't on board, then it doesn't matter because it's going to not work. They're not going to inspect it. So even if the dealer principal is on board with this and the general manager is on board, everybody has to be there. And so if I have an appointment setting department, whatever expectations I'm setting for the customer needs to be a part of the process and the word tracks that you trained on. And we inspect those. So if we are saying, okay, you're going to come in, we're going to have the car pulled up. How are we ready for that? How do we help the sales floor make sure they don't fumble? How that? the BDC rep make sure that that happens? Or, or should they even be responsible for that? That's a decision every dealership has to make. 
because in some stores, I've seen some stores where they have the BDC reps pulling the car up. I don't think that's a very effective thing to have the BDC do, but I have seen some stores do that. I I prefer to have a, uh, a handoff process. So it could either be that it's handed off and confirmed. Um, so once the BDC sets an appointment, got one store and I can't take credit for it. Brilliant, brilliant BDC manager. He's been an internet salesperson for a long time. And he decided when his store switched to BDC and he became the manager that for the salespeople, they are round robin assigning the appointments, but the salesperson doesn't get the appointment until they do a video confirmation for the client. So if you're up in queue, because your performance is where it needs to be, and the BDC assigns you that appointment, it's a tentative appointment for you until you do a video confirmation for the customer. The sales representative or the manager? Well, he's doing the sales representative, but the management team has decided which reps are eligible. Right. Okay, it, so that's the executive team, which I executive team. always, when I'm consulting a dealership, I always create an executive team pay plan and people earn the ability to be on the executive team. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think that's part of, of, again, another issue on why these departments are not successful because folks think it has to be one size fits all, but it's going to depend upon your store, but it has to be from the top down. It's got to be on the very top down. I'm glad you brought that up because so many dealerships today don't have that happening. Not at, not at all. Nope. No. And um, we talk about the outbound phone calls. We talk about recapturing lost business. Uh, we talked about database. What's the next step? Well, the, the next step, well, we were talking about inspection, but the next step, takes us even further. So assuming we have an in inspection, there's daily inspection points, weekly inspection points, and monthly, right? But the step five is, is follow through, actually. So if we are doing step four, which is inspecting what we expect of our teams every single day in how they're handling the customers in their different activity expectations, because we made it very clear, this is what we expect you to do every day. The fifth step is to make sure that you're not on set it and forget it mode because we all learned a lesson this year that things can change in an instant. And, and I've been in the business for, I started in 2002, so it's been a while now. I've seen so many different pivots and different changes in our market and how things work. And if you think you can put it in place and just leave it there and it's always going to be effective and efficient, I would like to know what you're, I'm, I don't even want to say that out loud, but I was about to say, I would like to know uh, what, what you might be smoking and where you got it from. Because My you think Stassi says he, he's, he's totally stealing this idea and they're not stealing it, we're giving it to you. Everyone get, not everybody gets the internet appointment. That, that impression, Steven's a friend of mine. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I, I had uh, actually my highest performing, the best performing yet uh, uh, BDC internet department. In that department, we had a dedicated team that was allowed and their performance, their closing ratio on BDC appointments was on a board, highest close to down. Everyone in the store was. There was that red line. And if your performance on closing it as a salesperson, like we're queuing it up for you. And everything was it was almost like a, a an evidence uh, a folder for the customer when it got handed off. So it was, there was no bobbling. But if you were below that line, you did not get BDC appointments. And I will never forget, and bless his heart, uh, he had right. been in the store for, for 20 years selling. And he, I, I we had eight, eight dealerships or eight stores in that group. And I just happened to be at that store that day. And I'm working with the BDC and he comes in having a fit, having a fit about how it is not fair that he does not get these internet or BDC appointments. And he's been at the dealership for 20 years and da, 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 da. And so I immediately walk over to that board and I think, so of shown BDC appointments, folks that had been served up to him on a platter the month prior, he only closed 9% of them. And so as he's coming in and that's on the board for everyone to see, and he's like, it's not fair. I said, you know what? It, you're, you're 100% right. It is not fair. It is not fair that 
the dealer principal of this dealership invested so much money on marketing to generate these opportunities. And it is not fair that the folks in this room who work 10 hours a day, six days a week, just like you, and spent all the time getting those customers to come in for you to not sell a car. You're right. It's not fair. Get out of the department. And so, so this dealership, this is, here's my, my word track on that. This dealership is not a safe house for underachievers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, there, it's not fair. We have performance-based pay plans for a reason. And that is a big part. And, and there is, that's why step four, Jim, is so important in, in making sure that we're inspecting those points. But to Michael's uh, a point that just came up on the screen here, if we don't follow up with that, with those quarterly inspection points, which is Step five is that follow through, making sure you're looking at some of those macro performance metrics on a quarterly basis. Some things that most people wouldn't even think of. Let's let's look at our customers. What's our open rate for our internet team? Who's our people opening our emails? What's our engagement rates? Looking to see if there are ways that we can tweak our process or our, our skill sets and tactics or word tracks to make it better or maybe the team is finally settling in and they're doing great, but that quarterly touch point is going to show you some marketing partners that are underperforming and you can make some changes there. Marketing partners. Are you talking about lead providers? Well, I choose, I choose not to do business with lead providers. I try to, too. I, I would prefer to have marketing partners. <laughs> Well, but yes, Jim. Yes. In my, in my experience, everybody that tells you they're your partner are probably in your pocket. You know, well, here's, it's kind of like your sales team. They're going to get away with whatever you let them get away with. Right. Yeah. Um, if you are not inspecting them and holding them accountable and quarterly, I like to do that because here's the thing, as you're building this type of department, whether it is 100% appointment setters, a hybrid method, whatever, as you're building your business development department. And you're a smaller dealer and the marketing manager is the BDC manager. Most generally is going to be the same person, right? Yeah. So when, you, when you're doing that, the first thing you got to do is people. That's why in the first step we talked about, you know, setting up, doing your forecast, figuring out a staffing requirement. Then you figure out the process, which we talked about, the tools and tactics and, and strategies that you're going to train people on. And, and from there, you've got to then look at products. So when I know that my people and my process are right and it's firing on all cylinders, then I can start evaluating my, my products. And if those products, because I, if for those of you on the screen and I'm getting ready for everybody to just throw their hands up, how many times have you been told from a marketing partner, partner. that it, it's not their product, it's because your people don't know how to handle the leads? How many times, they, they, they come in with some cock and bull story about attribution. <laughs> attribution is a genuine science, but I've, You've, how many times have you heard me say never trust statistics about a vendor supplied by the vendor? So it, I've heard you say that and it's fantastic. And, and folks, I have a, a unique perspective on it because I actually, I mean, I've, I've, I've studied, you know, forecasts and status doing now. Listen, I am not going to say I got A's in the um in the statistics courses that I had to take when I was training and, and earning my degree. But I did have to take a lot of statistics courses. So it, when you look at that, it, you have to understand when a vendor is bringing you in statistics, a couple things that you want to ask them. You want to ask them about, and this is not on topic, Jim, I'm sorry, but you brought, brought that point. Go there, go there. Is that you need to ask them, what is the sample size of this data set? So, because they love to come in and, oh, we surveyed a hundred customers that we sent you leads for. And this many purchase cores or this, that, or whatever. And they come in presenting this data, like it is so very important. So ask them about what is the, the sample size this study was done on. Ask them, is it a national study or is it regional? Because I will tell you what, I work with dealers all over the country and those things are different. 
a, a whatever the national number is, is not going to apply specifically to Houston or Indianapolis. It, it could be so far different. So if you're going to come in and tell me I'm not doing a good job, it better be regional numbers, something in my market with my consumer base. Local that actually SEO. <laughs> Show me my local, my local area. It fires me up sometimes because you get these partners and they're quite frankly, they're pushing people around and, and I, I like to hope at least I can help educate folks on the right questions to ask. Um, and then you got to judge for yourself by the answers that you get, but hundred percent don't trust the reports that that particular partner brought you at least verify them. Every time I do a call with one of our marketing partners, I have our Google Analytics open. And if they're going to give me data, and I all say to them all the time, well, which view are you looking at? Because that's what we should be looking at. We should be looking at what's happening there. And, and I guess probably I am more of a... Uh, I am more analytical on some of that. And I, I always like to give tips that make it easy for other dealers because they don't have that data background. So there are just some certain KPI and questions that you should have your benchmark for in your store and ask that of every single vendor. And I have, I've had, I've had presentations where it's so funny because I actually will do some fuzzy math on, um, on the units and gross. So I'm looking for a five time return on investment when I'm investing with a digital partner. And so I will, I'll take their data that they give me. I'll tell you about attribution and influence and I, I, the attribution influence, uh, Google analytics. You know, uh, there, there is, we all know that today's shopper is going to multiple different websites. We know that, that that yeah. is a fact. Uh, but when it boils down to it, as a, as, and I tell everybody this, and I, I thank you so much for all the kind words about programming and this, but when it boils down to it, I just sell cars. I help my teams sell more cars at well, every you're working with the dealership right now. And I'm not, not going to get into that, but how many stores in the, in the dealer group you're working with now? Um, so we've got, um, 17, Seven, um, what kind of franchises are they, they all over the, the board? It, it's all over the board. It's actually really unique. I'm so excited about it because it's a uh, 50% high line. And, uh, I've done a lot of, for those of you who have followed my career, you know, I started uh, in, in Michigan. So Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, GMC was my first store. And it is, it's very nice. I've been working with this group for a couple of years now and, uh, learning a lot about adapting to the Highline market. Stores, a lot of different franchises, uh, midline imports, midline domestics, and then yep. Highlines, um, you know, absolutely. The average car in the United States today is twenty four thousand dollars. That's that's the average car, whether it's Highline or uh, as domestic or import. But uh, yeah. Highlines. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a whole different process, right? Our our steps in how we handle those customers have to be different. We are always looking at that, um, in in trying to work in some of the the OEM standards into what your BDC is doing, that's going to vary so differently if you're talking about a Land Rover store compared to a Toyota store or a Ford store. So I think that's something that as you're looking at that, that last, that follow through step, right, is making sure as each quarter goes, you're setting a new goal and action plan. You said earlier, Jim, to explode into the growth. Well, there's a reason, folks, that they call me Next Level Briggs, because once we hit that original goal, then I'm going to be looking at it constantly. Now I'm measuring out how we get to that next tier. How do we get to the next level of success? When Richard Dyer came to Atlanta in, in the day, and, and we went from 40 units a month. We were operating out of a Dunkin' Donuts shop that was then converted to a car dealership with two stalls, 40 units a month. And we... We had to, we grew that dealership so fast, we had to buy the Greyhound bus station and convert it to Nice. A, I'm serious. We, <laughs> we, 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 uh, we grew to, you know, like 850 units a month within under a year and a half. Well, Jim, I think that is 
something. And, and what you said earlier was really important. You mentioned it, it was about the management team all coming together and everybody buying into the process and holding the team accountable. Because if just a couple members of the team are, okay, let's do this, you're not going to have success. And that is a fantastic success story that you have. I wasn't in sales management at the time. I was in F&I. Oh. But then I was running that particular store. I mean, to, to have that kind of growth, you'd have to be. Oh, we were, we were, but if a customer didn't buy a car for any reason, within 12 to 24 hours, a manager, not a salesperson, was on the phone with them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I like managers to verify the appointments. That is huge. That is huge. So if you don't have your managers calling and verifying and confirming your appointments, so this is something I, I don't understand. Again, that's part of that transition, Jim. You have your appointment setters that are making those appointments and, and then no one is actually getting ready for the customer. If the sales manager is confirming the appointment, they're having the conversation, they're getting ready for the customer. One thing that I also learned at the first store that I worked at, uh, because it was Cadillac, we trained on Ritz-Carlton standards. And one of the things that I took away from that is at Ritz-Carlton, they have a daily lineup where the, the team gets together and they talk about their guests that are coming in for the day so that they're ready. And I've started, I started implementing that into my BDCs. So when we have that sales management meeting, when it's time for the BDC manager to have their portion of that meeting, what the BDC manager is doing is prepping the rest of the sales management team for the customers that are coming in. And then we can start getting ready. And that's when you see you're smoothing out that transition and those closing rates go up. And, and that's why I am a believer that BD agents, and this was a long way to get to your answer, uh, that BD agents, I like to pay on both shown and closed because I want those teams working together. And, and if you separate free. that, they don't. They also get free pizza, right? Free pizza or sandwiches, oh, you know. But I, I, I'll tell you, honest to goodness, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm listening to you and um yeah, I, I see that the, the BD agents are not given the amount of respect in a dealership that I would give them. You know, I would give them a lot more authority, a lot more respect. And, you know, the, the idea that the sales management many times beats them down. I, I really hate that part of it. It, it is it is so hard in in dealerships all over. And, and I tell this, I have a number of folks that, that I mentor across the country at different, all different levels of their careers. And um, there is a particular BD agent um, and she's so very talented and, but she lets herself get beat up. She's at a, she's at a, um, a place where, you know, it's, it's not a bad place, but they do, that's kind of some old school sales management, right? And I'm going to yell at you until you do what I want you to do. But I'm an old school sales manager, so I don't actually know what you're supposed to do as a BDC agent, right? And and I had just, I told her, I said, here's the thing. It, you can't necessarily change it. You, you, you either, you can't, you're never going to change that sales manager. And this is a controversial piece of advice that I would give to a BD agent. So I know today we've been talking about how to build and, and run a successful department. But for BDC agents, you have to know how to run your own business as well. Because in the face of that, you have to make a decision. Either the pay plan is strong enough that you can put up with that kind of stuff and still serve your customers in a friendly way, or it's not. I would prefer, of course, that we can get everybody on board, but that's not the case in every dealership. We know that it's realistically, it's just not. So, but I agree with you. They are the ones taking care of our customers, their first impression. So they should be treated with respect. They are a part of the sales team. I have a saying when I'm teaching managers how to be managers. Nobody gives you authority, you take authority. Nobody gives you authority. Just your, your, your business card, your title does not give you authority. You take authority. You, you act authoritative. You act yet. You I have to teach managers how to be managers. I wish more people would teach managers how to be managers. <laughs> I teach man well, see, the trouble is most trainers never were a manager. I know. I know. And that is, you know, 
uh, that is a lot of what I do too. Uh, not not to the magnitude of of going in and and some of the things that you've done in the past, but I'm always a train the trainer kind of person. So whoever is going to be the champion for it in the store, those are the ones that that we're leaning into. And t- you know, we promote good salespeople into management and don't teach them how to lead a team or how to inspire people. If you can actually find out the motivation of your team, the why they come in and then inspire them to achieve their own goals, guess what? You don't actually ever have to get mean with them because One they're of the biggest problems in dealerships today is most general sales managers are glorified desk managers. They're not executive managers. They don't even understand how to be an executive manager. You know, it is, it is. You are 100% correct. Um, You know, they're, they're put into that role, but they're not even taught because if you're the general sales manager, you're responsible for the production of the new car manager and the used car manager as well. And, but if you're really just another desk manager, you're not going to be able to help the team grow. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with that. It you is. And I had a conversation before the broadcast. The other day, I posted online that I was going to give away my notes on a speech I did at Digital Dealer. So, you want to be a general sales manager, how to be a general sales manager. Mm-hmm. I was expecting 10 or 12 people to ask for those notes in that PowerPoint. 700 people asked me how to be a general sales manager. They asked me for that PowerPoint. That makes me happy because I've seen that presentation and it's great. It is really great. And and I think that is where we have a huge breakdown in our stores when we're setting on this path for digital dominance. Okay, we we hired the people, we hired a phone trainer, a BDC trainer, and now we're just going to hope that everything works. But you don't, you're missing that step, Jim. If your management team or your desk or however you want to refer to it in your store, if they are not prepped and ready to lead a digital dealership, success will be difficult. Especially with the, with the advent of concierge home delivery and some of the other things that are happening in the business, the BDC's role is only going to expand. It's going to be more prevalent. Uh, marketing is more important than salesmanship. So we're going to have to understand that and we're going to have to pay for it. And and I love that that you put those two things together. I about it was so funny because I it popped up in conversation and I found four years ago I did um, a quick little blurb for in it might have even been in in some uh, you know group. Uh, I did a quick little blurb because people were asking, and how do you value or how do you prove the ROI of a business development department? And I actually like to include that in my marketing expenses. So if I'm targeting for an overall cost per copy on my advertising expense, between $500, $600, uh, for some of the Highline stores, we get up to like $1,200 is, is the mark that the OEM wants us to have. But when we look at that, I include the cost of my BDC into that. So I have a target cost per copy for a business development department as well. I love it. Listen, kid, we could probably talk forever, but we have, we're north of an hour already. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, thank you guys for hanging on with us. um, I'm going to post this all over Facebook and I'm going to put it on my private platform. Um, Anything you'd like to say before we close it out? I I would just like to say for everybody who jumped on here, who is really looking at building or rebuilding a BDC is to take your time and make sure that you understand your goals and make a plan. Give your team the tools that they need and the training they need, and then just get out of their way, except for your inspection points. Follow the steps. You know, Jim will have this. It'll be posted. You guys can go back. If you weren't able to grab notes, feel free to reach out uh, to me either on uh, social or via text message. And I'm happy to go back over that outline with you. But really make sure it's a profit center and not a call center. That is what I'd like to leave them with. Love, love and admiration always. Um, I hope everybody got some good information here. I'm going to end this broadcast. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone.